remind you about uh, three quotations from the Quran. You know this very well. The stars have repeated and re-repeated it. So let me repeat it again. First, we did not leave anything out of this scripture or book. Surah 638. Remember that now. Second, Shall I seek other than God a source of law when he revealed to you this book fully detailed? The word, then I'm skipping a line, the word of your Lord is complete in truth and justice. Surah 615, 14, 15. The third one. After saying that uh, he and Allah had put the Quran together, after reciting it, he said, then it is we who will explain. I think it's very clear. Allah says he has not left anything out of the scripture. It is complete, perfect, detailed, and he will explain it. After he reveals or after the recitation. These quotations clearly imply that the questions raised by the Quran, see the Quran raises questions, or questions raised by Muslims Will, the answers of this will be found in the Quran itself. Alright? If we take these quotations the way Allah presents it to us, it means if the Quran raises a question, or if we raise a question, the answer must be found in the Quran. I hope you agree with me on that point. If not, then just uh, listen to what I have to say. Now, we must not look in the Quran for irrelevant or insignificant things. Let us not go to Quran to find out a recipe for chicken curry or Afghan pilaf. <laughs> but certainly, if you know the Quran now, the Quran tells us do not serve poison curry to your friends or to your enemies. <laughs> On the contrary, if you are cooking curry and you have a hungry guest, you serve him. You feed the, feed the hungry. The Quran in many instances says that men of understanding know or will come to know the revelations of Allah. So it seems that there is another way of knowing the Quran if you understand it. But this is apparent. Because if we ask the question, who are men of understanding? They are the righteous. And who are the righteous? They are the believers and they are those who study the Quran. So either Allah explains it to you directly and you will know the answer, or you have understanding, but the man of understanding is one who goes to Quran. So in any case, the answer is in the Quran. I hope this is a, this is a logical technique. If A gives you B, and not A gives you B, since either A or not A, in any case, it is B. So it's the Quran in any case. 
whether Allah tells it to you directly or use your understanding, it is still good in Quran. Yet, there are dangers or obstacles or warnings, which I think we should mention in trying to get explanations to our questions or to get further elucidation to Quranic verses. The first warning. But this is just my opinion. It's up to you to accept it or not. First is too much emphasis on the Jewish Bible in making us understand the Quran. I said too much emphasis. The Bible, the Jewish Bible in particular, has been edited, re-edited, and re-re-edited in it has assumed its final form only 150 years before Christ, after the Babylonian captivity. That is after Ezra edited it, describes re-edited it. Now this is accepted by biblical scholars. And Muslims must not have an inferiority complex by depending so much on the Jewish scriptures. Or, the other way around, Muslims should not be so proud that they know so much about the Jewish Bible. Because you'll find out, if you read the tafsirs of our ancestors, anything that is difficult in the Quran to them, they call the Bible, not so much to help us understand the Quran, but to show that they know so much about the Jewish Bible. And in trying to show so much that they know about the Jewish Bible, they begin to forget their own Quran. Now this happens to <coughs> learned Muslims. It is a defect which many of us have, including your humble self. It's showing off. I notice that. I fall into the trap. I always want to show that I know the Bible, at least to show that I didn't waste 12 years in a Catholic school. <laughs> now we have to be, we have to check ourselves, check our pride that we know something about the Bible, and at the same time, not to have this inferiority complex. Because in the first hundred years of Islam, when there were discussions with Christians in Syria and so on, the Muslims had to show that they also knew what the Christians knew. But this is historical. We must also consider that the Jewish Bible serves national purposes, genealogical purposes. And that's the meaning of the editing. It is always to show that the Jews are a distinct people different from others. And this overemphasis that they are the chosen people makes them, in their editing, emphasize more what is to their direct interest. Also, it's not at all safe to always explain the Quran through the Bible as we now have it. But, there is a qualification, there is nothing wrong in pointing out certain correspondences between events or incidents or characters in the Quran and those in the Bible. This is not just a matter of scholarship, but it is a matter of developing our understanding. Please do not misunderstand me, brothers and sisters, or sisters and brothers and sisters. I don't know what's the protocol. I'm not saying we should not consult the Jewish Bible. I said, let us not overemphasize. On the contrary, it is good to show certain correspondences if, in the final analysis, it will help us understand the Quran. As long as the events are consistent, well and good. But when there are discrepancies, then the Quran must be the final one. It must supersede the Bible. Other things in the Bible can be dismissed as irrelevant to the Quranic message. Details about rituals, details about sacrifices, the lives of their kings, their adulteries, their incest, all of this. It is all irrelevant. The great danger is to interpret or understand the Quran solely, exclusively in terms of the Bible, rather than letting the Quran explain itself, or letting Allah explain himself to the Quran. This, however, does not mean, as I said, that we must neglect the Bible entirely. On the contrary, as I would like to show, 
it will be of some help in giving additional information. But, as I'll try to show, it is an information that can be reached back by the Quran and must be thoroughly con be consistent with the Quran. Needless to say, just uh, a bad if not worse, is consulting the Hadith to explain the Quran. This is superfluous, huh? There are people who use the Hadith to explain the Quran. I would not give examples of this because some of them are very, I mean, are very comical, I would say. In any case, this must be avoided. A criteria to guide us is that the Quran is flawless, totally consistent, as stated in Surah 18, verse 1. Quran also talks about masalans, examples, speaks of allegories, similitudes, analogies, etc., together with direct verses. And let me quote, talking of Allah, He is the one who revealed this scripture to you with perfect verses that must be taken literally as constituting the essence of the scripture. Other verses are allegorical, mutashahibat. Those who harbor doubts in their hearts dwell on the allegorical verses to create confusion and misrepresentation thereof. No one knows the correct interpretation thereof except God and those well founded in knowledge, those who listen to Allah. Unquote. And uh, it's very clear some people avoid the clear verses of the Quran or rather. They concentrate on the allegories to forget the clear verses of the Quran in order to bring dissension and so on. But Allah does not tell us that we should not try to study these allegories. We should try to understand these allegories of the Quran, but not use them to create dissension. One of the ideas here of this verse is that such allegories must not be interpreted in an arbitrary manner so as to cause dissension for religious or sectarian motives. Their interpretation must be in terms of the Quranic verses in a consistent or logical manner. Allah says, Alif, Lam, Mir, a scripture whose verses were perfectly designed, then elucidated from the one who is wise, wise of his son. In brief, Allah himself declares that he explains or elucidates his allegories. In the second khutbah, we will have one example to explain all of these things that we have mentioned along theoretical lines. Now, this is one example for your elucidation or another situation for your edification and entertainment. One subject only to illustrate what we have discussed. The problem of the nakedness of Adam and Eve. Okay? All of us, especially we who live in the Western world, are inheritors or victims of Western culture, of Western paintings, of Western movies, TVs and so on. What do we always see? We always see Adam and Eve depicted as physically naked. Even before the so-called fall, huh? there's a movie, I saw a movie, that is the trailer. A young boy, a young girl running. Well, there are leaves around me, but they're naked. Then you see Michelangelo's painting. Happy, a happy couple, young man, a young woman, naked. So that is now in our mind. Now paradise was a kind of a new discovery. <laughs> and from this, as well as our reading of the Bible, we begin to accept the second element is that because of this nakedness they use fig leaves, okay? I don't know why fig leaves, I have an answer for that. <laughs> but uh, 
A little bit, of course, so I will not say. But if you look at the shape of the feet here, it's good enough to cover three aspects of a man's body. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the Bible specifically mentions feet leaves. The Quran does not, huh? The Quran does not say that Adam and Eve covered themselves with fig leaves. The Quran only <coughs> says they covered with themselves with leaves of the garden. More versatile. Now, the Bible says that after the fall, when they covered themselves with fig leaves, the good Lord taught them how to use skins. And very interesting. So Allah, in the Jewish Bible, becomes a tailor. <laughs> he tells Adam and Eve, no, big leaves not good enough. Skins. Maybe the garden was becoming colder. What does the Quran say? Okay, let's go slowly and carefully. Surah 20, verses 117, 118. How is it? Surah 20, 117, 118. Allah warns Adam and Eve not to let Satan lead to their evictment from the garden and to cause them misery. For in the garden, Adam and Eve were guaranteed food and they were guaranteed that they will not go naked. What follows from this is that Adam and Eve in the garden were told not to worry about food and clothing. Things that they will have to worry when they are evicted. And Allah says, and I quote translation of Star, you are guaranteed that you will not hunger therein nor go naked. Conclusion, logical conclusion. Adam and Eve were not naked in paradise, okay? It's very clear. Number two. And Allah says in Surah 7, 27, O children of Adam, let not the devil mislead you as he evicted your parents from paradise and removed their garments in order to show them their bodies. This is the translation. Others instead of bodies say, expose their shame, the shameful parts, etc. This is something else. I'm not talking about that. That is for another good time. Now, why will Allah say that the devil will remove your garment if you were naked? Huh? Allah says the devil will remove your garment. And if you combine that with the first, it's very clear they have clothes. In Surah 7, verse 20, uh, 27, Allah says, very clear that Adam and Eve had garments which Satan removed from them or caused to be removed from them. Now, this is a digression. Translators, unduly influenced by the Bible, put a parenthesis after robe or garment. And they say, and Satan took away them from them the robes, they put parenthesis of innocent cloth. Quran never said of innocent. He just says, the devil took away the rope. But translators, because they read the Bible, and they still think of the Bible, and with inferiority complex, they say, oh, innocent. Because the idea is that Adam and Eve were innocent. Well, I don't think Adam and Eve were that innocent. Allah had taught them the names, which the angels did not know. So they had knowledge. This is not a bunch of little kids jumping in It's more than that. Okay. Surah 7 again 22 and Surah 21 21 says that after they lost their robes or garments, they began to cover themselves with leaves of the garden, leaves from paradise. And in 7, Surah 7 26, it's very beautiful, Allah reveals to them a better garment or raiment. Ah, very beautiful. You see, in the Jewish Bible, they were naked, they put fig leaves, and Allah says, skins are better. Okay. Quran. 
They were clothed, they lost their clothes, and Adam and Eve made their own clothes on their own. It's very important, huh? on their own. Let us say Allah told them, on their own. And Allah says, oh children of Adam, we have sent down to you, or revealed to you, garments to cover your bodies for shame. As luxury, this is that translation. Another possibility is the luxury to cover your body in a splendid or magnificent manner. See, I don't like the word, with all respect to that. I understand what it means by luxury. It's like something luxurious. But it just happens that the word luxury these days has a bad connotation, huh? See, people are trying now to be more modest. Nothing luxurious. But I understand what the luxury means. I think it means splendid or magnificent. And Allah says, the garment of righteousness is the best. Now again, translation for the Quran. They say, Allah did not like the leaves of paradise, gave them splendid garments, and then say, however, better than the splendid garments are the garments of righteousness. No, this is wrong. I think it's my translation. I prefer Ustaz's translation when he says, the garment of righteousness is the best. Ustaz does not say that this is another garment, huh? Actually, I think the garment of righteousness is the very garment which Allah gave to Adam and Eve. Something that is, is splendid and magnificent. Because the Arabic word is wa. And, but again, Arabic translation, because the influence by the Jewish Bible, they say, Allah, the Jewish Bible says, they were with leaves, and then Allah gives them skins. Then the Quran, Allah gives them splendid raiment. Then they say, Allah gives them splendid raiment, and then says, however, the garments of righteousness are better. No, these are the garments of righteousness. The splendid vestments are the garments of righteousness. In other words, Allah does not, did not bother with skins and so on and so on. He just gave them a garment, the garment of righteousness, which is best. It is almost saying, Better than the fig leaves are garments of righteousness. These are luxurious, magnificent, or splendid. So let's. To me, this is only one robe. One robe is mentioned in Surah 7, 26. The garments of righteousness is the splendid or luxurious one. The Arabic is what? And doesn't say and something else. He could refer to. He is good and tall. It's not that he is good now, then he becomes tall. He could be both good and, and tall. But let me not go into this logical aspect. Now let's go to the sequence. Adam and Eve are robed their garments. Number two, they lost their robes. Number three, they made their own robes. Number four, Allah teaches them or reveals to them the best robes. Now, the problem of interpretation. I hope Allah forgives me if it's not so good. Adam and Eve, I believe, originally wore the garments of complete obedience. They were wearing the garments of obedience in a natural state or as a natural condition. They were just obeying because that is how they were created, just to obey. But, as Surah 20, verse 21 says, Adam disobeyed Allah, and thus in 7, 27, they lost this robe of obedience. Yeah, if you wear the robe of obedience, then you disobey, you lose the robe of disobedience, right? And that is what the Quran says, Adam, Took away from them their robes because they disobeyed. Number three, 2021. 20, Adam and Eve clothed themselves on their own. Not very effectively, it seems, huh? Not very effectively because Allah says, this is not the right one. Now, it's very important. This is now what? Man made, huh? Man made on his own. And Allah teaches them that the garments of righteousness, that is the best. And he teaches them how to 
survey. And this garment of righteousness is like the original garment, one of obedience, but now being taught by Allah with the consideration that mankind has now a free choice to wear it or not to wear it. In other words, it must be acquired by free will. The first garment of obedience was just given to Adam. He was not consulted. Adam, do you want it or not? He was just given the garments of obedience. But now the garments of righteousness, it's there. You want it or you don't want it. The element of free will is there. And it's very interesting because precisely in 726, God says, these are God's revelations to you that you may take heed, that you may remember. And thus, I submit to you that the issue on what nakedness is or shame is represents or symbolizes in the story of Adam and Eve is something else. We have not talked what does nakedness mean, you know? I did not. This is something else. I'm not going to discuss their meaning. All what I'm pointing out here is that the issue of physical nudity or physiological nakedness is not the main issue. Physical nudity is just one instance. I'm not saying it's not involved. I'm only saying that it is only one instance among many other things that falls under the general category or issue of obedience and righteousness. Uh, let me repeat again. I am not denying that the element of decency is involved here. I'm only saying that the element of decency is only one aspect which falls under the general category of righteousness. <coughs> All right? And therefore, this emphasis about the nakedness of uh, Adam and Eve is not so important to me now. It's not the main issue. It is an issue, but not the main issue. What is an issue are really three concepts. The concept of obedience, the concept of disobedience, and the concept of righteousness. And may I add, righteousness taught by Allah himself, rather than man-made definitions like the leaves of the garden. That's man-made. Now, with your kind patience, let us go further. <laughs> Remember <coughs> these three concepts, all right? Obedience, disobedience, and righteousness. You recall a few weeks ago, there was a discussion in one of our Quranic sessions, I was going to say session, it almost came out as section. <coughs> it had to do with Surah 95. Mustafa mentioned it is this one was seen was the tomb by the thin by, by the thin by the <laughs> by the fig and the olive and Mount Sinai.